I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture about the case Public Citizen versus the U.S. Department of Justice, a 1989 U.S. Supreme Court case about the Federal Advisory Committee Act, or FACA, and the ABA's Standing uh, Committee on the Federal Judiciary, or Advisory Committee. Um, by the way, even though I have here a picture of the ABA's front doors, uh, this video is not done in connection with or endorsed by the ABA. Now, this case, I, just for my students, is in my statutory interpretation and regulation case book because of uh, in the section about the absurdity doctrine, and that's we get sort of a new twist on the absurdity doctrine in this case. I also want think that this video would be useful for my administrative law students because it introduces you to one of our statutes that applies to regulatory agencies similar to the Freedom of Information Act or the Government in the Sunshine Act. This is FACA or the Federal Advisory Committee Act is one of our transparency and government statutes that requires open meetings and record keeping that's available to the public and so forth. So let's look at what happened in this case. <clears throat> The Federal Advisory Committee Act, or FACA, imposes a variety of record keeping and open meeting requirements on outside advisory committees, including temporary charters, they have to be reconstituted every two years, and balanced membership, they're supposed to have members from various viewpoints. Uh, the concern that occasioned the statute was that too many federal agencies were relying on these special committees, these advisory committees, for big policy questions and decisions. And I hope you can see that this is a type of delegation, not to another branch of government, but to a sort of an outside third party entity. Some of these um, advisory committees were impaneled by the agencies. So the agency would put together some experts um, and to advise on policy decisions, especially difficult questions um, and that, that required a lot of, let's say scientific knowledge or something like that, or knowledge of the industry. And sometimes these were professional associations like what we're gonna talk about in this case. I hope you can see the arguments for and against having these advisory committees. On the one hand, um, agencies love to get the right answer and really like to talk to the experts and rely on the, the people with the most knowledge. So why wouldn't you want to get advice from a panel of super knowledgeable people on this subject? On the other hand, there's concerns about deep state or some sort of shadow government of these um, obscure committees that nobody knows about that are really pulling the strings in the background and making the decisions that we all have to live with. <clears throat> Sorry, the, um, the statute defines these advisory committees as any committee, board, commission, council, conference, panel, task force, or other similar group, or any subcommittee or subgroup thereof, which is established or utilized by one or more agencies. And by the way, that phrase, established or utilized, is the sort of crux of this case in the interest of obtaining advice or recommendations for the president or one or more agencies or officers in the federal government. And so the question that there's no question that in this case where we're talking about the ABA, that the agencies didn't establish the ABA, but they were using advice or recommendations from the American Bar Association. And so the issue in this case is whether the statutory definition that I just read to you applies to the ABA Standing Committee on the Federal Judiciary, and from which the Justice Department solicits for the president ratings of prospective judicial nominees. In other words, when the president wants to nominate someone to the federal bench, not just the Supreme Court, but circuit courts or district courts, a lot of times a request will go to this standing committee from the ABA and they will vet the person, right? They'll do look into their credentials and their history of law practice, um, whether they have disciplinary actions against them, what their coworkers and former supervisors say about them and so forth. And the ABA will make a recommendation about whether this individual is qualified or not qualified for the federal bench. Now, please note this isn't binding on the president or on Senate, the Senate 
confirmation or judiciary committee, but they it it is part of the evidence and it's one of the things that's given consideration and talked about during the nomination process and during the confirmation process. And as a result, these have become politically controversial, at least for the nominations that elicit strong partisan reactions, especially US Supreme Court nominations. A lot of people, we never get news coverage of district court nominations or even a lot of the circuit court nominations that the ABA makes recommendations on. And these are really, really lengthy, extensive, comprehensive reports that are very useful for people who want to vet candidates before we give them a life tenure position as a federal judge. <clears throat> so the majority here, basically to cut to the chase, is going to say that FACA um, doesn't apply and that what this practice of the um, Department of Justice getting recommendations from the ABA is fine. So the court begins the majority though by acknowledging that the statute superficially would seem to apply because the president or and the DOJ are using or utilizing a <clears throat> advice from an outside advisory committee. But the majority says that the word utilized, they call it a woolly verb, and concludes that a literal application of the statute would produce results Congress would not have intended. And here we get to sort of a novel way of expressing the absurdity doctrine. The court says that a straightforward reading um, like the public citizen wants, and public citizen is an act, kind of a citizen activist group that litigates for government reform. Um, and, and if their interpretation of the statute uh, were adopted by the court, then it would have other absurd results, never mind the ABA's committee. So for example, it gives three examples in the majority opinion. If the president seeks the views of the NAACP before nominating commissioners to the EEOC, then the, under this reading of the statute, they wouldn't be allowed to do that. No one thinks a president can't do that. And so that would be absurd. Or if the president, quote, asked the leaders of an American Legion post for the organization's opinion on some aspect of military policy, why shouldn't the president ask veterans associations, basically that's what the American Legion is, um, what their views are of some pending um, foreign policy decision? Uh, here's the third example. If the president consults with his own political party before picking the cabinet. Well, of course we think the president is going to consult with his party's leadership before picking his cabinet when he gets elected. And so the court uh, concluded that Congress would not have intended um, that we use the words literally, and they invoked the Church of the Holy Trinity case, sorry, that should be in italics, um, the, and reasoned that it could permissibly search for a narrower intended meaning. Now, before I talk about the dissent, I just want to make sure you understand what the majority did here. So normally, we, we have this very old doctrine of the absurdity doctrine that for statutory interpretation, where courts can kind of draw the line at a inconceivable result and say, so look, we're not going to give the statute a literal reading if it produces an inconceivable, absurd result, but it's always the result in that case. And here, and the problem is that it's kind of conceivable that Congress might have a problem with how powerful the American Bar Association has become and the role they play in um, picking federal judges and vetting federal judges for nomination. And so, um, the, what the majority does is they say the interpretation, regardless of the result in this case, would produce all these other three absurd results. So therefore, it's an absurd uh, interpretation that we can't adopt. And that's sort of a one step removed application of the absurdity doctrine um, that's a little unusual and it's a little out of step with what common law judges would have done. So let's talk about Justice Kennedy's concurrence. Um, Justice Kennedy, uh, and he was joined by some of the other justices, he concurred in the judgment. In other words, he thought there was no problem with the president soliciting advice from the ABA or anyone else for that matter, because he thought that banning that, uh, prohibiting it, would violate the president's constitutional authority under the Appointments Clause. And, uh, but he still insists that the majority is doing something weird with the absurdity doctrine, which arguably they are. 
And so Justice Kennedy and the, those who joined him thought that this actually would have created constitutional issues and therefore there should be no prohibition on the president asking anyone for advice as part of his appointment authority. Now, he doesn't disavow the absurdity doctrine. He just thinks that courts should be using it more sparingly than they are. Um, they should use limit it to cases um, where it is impossible that Congress would have intended the result and where the alleged absurdity is so clear as to be obvious to most anyone, he says. So the court, the majority here holds that FACA does not apply to the ABA committee's judicial recommendations. Please note that this is really kind of a political absurdity case. The application is absurd, not because the policy is without any justification. Again, one can imagine reasons to be concerned. There were people that were objecting to the ABA's role in um, qualifying judges. But because it's so unlikely that Congress would have wanted to, uh, would have agreed to ban the ABA from evaluating nominees. This leaves us with a question though, and especially Justice Kennedy's concurrence, but also the, some of the language in the majority opinion. If the doctrine is really based on the idea that Congress is presumed not to intend the absurd result, why do we call it the absurdity doctrine? Why not just ask whether Congress would have passed a bill with this result expressly mentioned? In other words, why don't we just phrase it as a, we really don't think Congress would have intended that um, instead of pretending that the result is somehow um, outrageous inherently or using the wrong word almost as a pretext. By the way, now this is the administrative law point that I hope you find helpful. Um, the notes following the case in my uh, case book suggest the procedural history of FACA was complicated. And there were rival bills that went through each house of Congress, basically. So when, uh, if you think back to the, I'm just a bill sitting on Capitol Hill, you could have slightly different versions of a bill going through the House and the Senate at the same time and get voted on or uh, approved by both houses. And in this case, usually it, it's very like minor differences between the two, slightly different wording. But here, the House version only said establish, only applied FACA to committees that agencies were establishing, which if that's what the statute said, we wouldn't have this case because there's no question that the Department of Justice didn't create the ABA or its standing committee. But then there's this conference committee after the bills pass each house that gets together and merges the two versions, the House version and the Senate version, and reconciles the language. And then it goes to a straight thumbs up or thumbs down vote in each house, usually without any debate. So the conference committee changed it and to establish or utilized like the Senate version said, which of course is going to apply to other um, organizations besides those actually impaneled by the agency. Now, maybe the House didn't want such broad coverage, but given the way Congress votes on the conference report, it's up or down on what the conferees agreed to. So maybe House members preferred a narrower bill, but acquiesced to the broader bill that came out of the conference committee as better than no bill at all, right? Because they didn't want to vote it down just because of this one word difference and that they thought wouldn't matter most of the time. Or we also have to wonder if the conference committee members from time to time seize the opportunity to force an agenda knowing that they can get away with it. Okay, that concludes my lecture about the um, public citizen versus Department of Justice case.